Before I share the sermon this morning, I want to say Happy Mother's Day. And every Mother's Day, when we're at the church, I always share this poem entitled The Watcher Mother. It was in the flyleaf of my grandmother's Bible, and I memorized it when I was a child. So here is the poem, The Watcher Mother. She always leaned to watch for us, anxious if we were late, in winter by the window, in summer by the gate. And though we mocked her tenderly, who had such foolish care, the long way home would seem more safe because she waited there. Her thoughts were all so full of us. She never would forget. And so I think that where she is, she must be watching yet, waiting till we come home to her, anxious if we are late, looking from heaven's window, leaning from heaven's gate. God bless you and happy Mother's Day. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in that precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we come because we are hurting, because we have needs. And Father, the word tells us that we are to cast our burden on the Lord and he will sustain us. Father, we pray today for our country. We pray for our leaders. We ask for our president. We pray for all who are involved in making things better for us. We pray for our first responders, our nurses, our doctors. We pray for our military. We pray, pray for our protection services, our policemen, our firemen, and all that are involved in our care. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you would minister to us this day from your precious word. Encourage our hearts, lift our spirits, and oh God, we pray that you would reach out to those in our country who are suffering deeply because of the loss of loved ones and others, Lord, who are suffering in hospitals from various afflictions, not only this crisis situation. We pray that you would be with us all. We need your help. Lord, we love you. We pray that your name shall be glorified as we seek to exalt you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Poet Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote, one God, one law, one element, and one far-off divine event to which the whole creation moves. Now, it's interesting that the last words of this declaration are inscribed in the dome of our nation's capital. One far-off divine event to which the whole world moves. A visitor saw this inscription and asked a guide what that meant. And the guide said, well, I think it refers to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there are numerous statements and representations of biblical concepts in various government buildings in Washington, D.C. And there are also some of those in state capitals that make it quite evident that America was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. I believe that the divine event, the second coming of Christ, is nearer than many people realize. The concept of Christ's return was not the product of the wild imagination of the disciples. Jesus himself promised that he would come again. He said, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We are not to be confused and think that Jesus only meant that he was coming to dwell in us by virtue of the new birth. For we read in Acts chapter 1, as Jesus was ascending into heaven, these marvelous words that an angelic messenger gave to those who were standing by and watching Christ's ascension. He said, this same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner, as you have seen him go into heaven. Now that's quite emphatic. This same Jesus will also come in like manner, as you have seen him go into heaven. There are more prophecies in the Bible about Christ's second coming than there are about his first coming. And there are many about his first coming in the Old Testament. When I look at our world, its immorality, the hatred, the beheading of innocent people, the governments that are in turmoil, corruption in high places, churches that are far removed from the power evident in the New Testament church, 
I too am longing for the coming of the Lord. One of the challenges facing the early church was the denial of the fact that Jesus would come again. And that challenge still faces us. It comes to us in two forms. There is an outright denial that such a thing is possible. And then there is the neglect of it by pastors failing to preach about it because there are so many different views about it. Friends, Star Wars is an exciting fantasy. But the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is an exciting reality. And whether you agree with me or not, I'm here to inform you that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. Jesus said he would. The Bible confirms that he will. So I'm going to preach it. There's a nice little saying that's been going around for years. And it goes like this. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Well, that's a nice saying, but I think it can be improved. How about God said it, that settles it, I believe it. Whether I believe it or not, it is still settled on the fact that God said it. And this is what we have in the Word of God, both in the Old and the New Testament prophecies that the Messiah will return. Now let me give you something to which to tie our thoughts. First of all, we're going to speak to you about the declaration of Christ's coming. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Then we're going to talk about the day of the Lord in verse 10 of that same chapter. And then finally, the diligence of God's people in verses 11 through 18. The declaration of Christ's coming. In the passage before us, Peter says that he has written his letters to stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Many times there are things that we know but there are things that we allow to be put in the back of our minds, and therefore we forget them. So let me read from the Word of God. Brethren, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of our Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly forget, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In the passage before us, we hear Peter saying, I want you to remember some things. And you know, there are a lot of things that we forget, but we need to remember. And Peter's desire is that they not forget the great truths declared by those who have gone on before. One of the greatest disasters in our time is that in our country, we are either denying our past or throwing our past on the garbage heap. Sometimes remembrance is a painful thing, but I think it's a necessary thing. And we are making a tremendous mistake in our time by attempts to erase our history, the history of the world, and not teach it in our schools. We learn both from the good and from the bad in history. When asked by the disciples what the sign of his coming would be, the very first thing that Jesus said was, take heed that no one deceive you. We do well right now to consider what is going on in our world to determine how much is deception and how much is truth. The deception in our time is out of bounds. What should we know about the Lord's coming? Beside the fact of his coming, we should know that people will scoff at the very thought and suggestion of his coming. 
After having preached on the second coming of Christ, when I was a pastor in another city, a man in the congregation said to me, Pastor, ever since I was a young boy, I've heard that Jesus was coming again. Now I'm well along in age and Jesus hasn't come yet. I'm just not sure about his ever coming again. I looked at him and I said, Henry, do you know that you are in the Bible? He said, really? I said, yes. In 2 Peter 3.3, 3, it says, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days. He looked at me, dropped his head, and then he said, Pastor, forgive me. I won't doubt it anymore. Some missionary friends of ours were at a booth at the Del Mar Fairgrounds in California some years ago sharing the gospel. Someone stopped at the booth and asked John, our missionary friend, can you tell me my fortune? And John replied, no, I can't tell you your fortune, but I can tell you your future. If you have received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will be saved. But if you haven't, you're going to be lost. And that's just where it is. In verse 3, Peter tells us that scoffers are walking after their own lusts. Now, those are pretty strong words. In verse 4, we have the question scoffers ask, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Friend, this was either a naive or just plain ignorant statement. Such is not the case, even in our time. Technically, things are drastically changing before us. Events right now in the last few months are in line with Old and New Testament prophecies that, that we can certainly say that all things are not as they were. I just wish we could start over from two months ago. At the time of the writing of this epistle, Rome ruled over the Holy Land. And interestingly, today Israel is a nation just as it was promised in the Bible. At the time of Jesus, Babylon was not much in the news, but today Babylon, Iraq, Iran, and the Middle East, they're in the news all the time. At the time of Jesus, Meshach and Tubal were cities in what is now modern-day Russia. They are mentioned in the prophecies of Ezekiel as the great bear in the north that would come south to the Middle East. Today, Russia is in Syria, Things in our time are certainly not continuing as they were. Peter reminds his readers how quickly things can change and uses the flood of Noah's time in his example in verse 5. God can change things quickly with floods, with tornadoes, with hurricanes and eruptions of volcanoes. In fact, shortly after this epistle was written in 79 AD, the city of Pompeii, was no more because of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Along with volcanic eruptions come great geological changes that defy much of modern science, such as the case with Mount St. Helens. A scoffer is someone who takes lightly what needs to be taken seriously. The people of Noah's day scoffed at the idea of a flood and a coming judgment. But the flood came, and judgment came with that flood. And just prior to this, Peter had been speaking in chapter 2 of false prophets. Perhaps these scoffers were from that group of false prophets. When people reject the word of God, when people want to do their own thing, they are resisting God's direction for life. When the word of God challenges our lifestyle, it isn't the word that needs to be adjusted. It isn't the word that needs to be changed. It's us, and it's our lifestyle. Someone has said, if mankind will not understand the meaning of judgment, they will never understand the meaning of grace. I want to repeat that. If mankind will not understand the meaning of judgment, they will never understand the meaning of grace. Now, the point of this passage is that the same God who created this world caused its destruction through water, can do whatever he wants to do. 
God can interfere with what man calls nature, with earthquakes, floods, fires, and catastrophes of all sorts. The statement, all things continue as they were, is a blatant denial of facts. Verse 7 tells us that the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. And until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And this verse certainly fits well with what John wrote in the book of the Revelation, chapter 21, verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first earth, heaven, and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. God has the power to interrupt the course of history and nature at any time he wishes to accomplish his own purposes. In Psalm 11, verse 3, we read that God does whatever he pleases. Looking at what is taking place right now in our country and in our world should certainly be reason to seek the Lord. The word of God says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked man forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and God will abundantly pardon. God moves in eternity, friends, and time is not the same with him. Verse 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Time is not the same to God as it is to us. God exists above and apart from time. It may seem to us that God is slow in bringing the world to judgment. Indeed, God is slow to anger. And if one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day with God, what seems a long time to us is not a long time with God. Let's just consider all these things that God is involved in and God is doing in our world. A long time to us is a short time as far as God is concerned. You know, I think sometimes we forget that there's a difference in the economy of God and the economy of man. Why has God waited? And why has God put up with so much rebellion against him? Why has he waited so long to bring mankind to judgment? Because, as verse 9 puts it, he has long suffered toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Someone has written, you can slap God in the face, you can turn your back on him. You can take his name in vain, but you cannot keep him in reaching out in love to you. The breadth of his love, dear friends, is that God so loved the world. The length of his love is that he gave his only begotten son. The depth of his love, dear friends, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The height of his love, everlasting life. God is patient. He's not rushing things. He has eternity behind him. He has eternity ahead of him. Hallelujah. What a savior. Remember, scoffers are to be expected. Remember, God's word is consistent. God is not affected by time. God is long suffering. Now let's consider this matter of the day of the Lord in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. The day of the Lord. Coming as a thief in the night. Now the term thief in the night indicates that it will come rather unexpectedly. I agree with Bible expositor Vernon McGee that the day of the Lord is an extended period of time which opens with the rapture of the church. That means that the church is going to be taken from the earth. Then there's going to be a great tribulation of the earth, followed by the thousand-year reign of Christ, a brief rebellion by Satan, and finally judgment at the great white throne. And this Lord who comes for his church will come with his church before this thousand-year reign of Christ. After this is mentioned here and in the book of Revelation, the new heavens and the new earth will come into view. This world, as we know it now, is headed for destruction. Now, friend, I believe in recycling. I believe in taking care of the planet. But I'll tell you something. This planet is one day going to be gone as it is. 
there's going to be new heavens and a new earth. Now, if there was nothing to live for but extinction, and if the world is going nowhere, there would be nothing in life but a kind of hopelessness. In 1 Corinthians 15, 19, we read, If in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. You know, there are a whole lot of people who are in this world who are miserable because they're without any hope. We say that they are hopeless. However, those of us who have received the Lord as our Savior and believe in the promises of God, we live in hope. Those without Christ in their life are facing a hopeless end. Those who have received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior have an endless hope. Let's look again at verse 2. What 10. What's coming at the end of time as we know it? The heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat, and both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Now, I think that this is a very different kind of global warming than from the ecological gurus of our day. There's a gospel chorus that goes, Oh, my loving brother, when the world's on fire, you'll need my Jesus to be your savior. Then look at these closing verses that we're going to share with you. Verses 11 through 15. And we read here. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we... According to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord Jesus is salvation. As also our beloved Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. The diligence of God's people. In light of what we know that is going to take place ultimately, Peter issues the challenge for those who know, that know Christ to live lives that witness of God's mercy and God's grace. How will people ever believe the truths of God's word if they fail to see the effects of God's word in the lives of those who profess to believe it? The words, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness are challenging. And we should be troubled when we fall short of being a good testimony before those who don't know the Lord Jesus. About the year 127 or 125 AD, a Greek by the name of Astrotides was writing to one of his friends about a new religion called Christianity. He was trying to explain the reasons for its extraordinary success. And this is what he wrote. If any righteous man among the Christians passes from this world, they rejoice and offer thanks to God and may escort his body with songs and thanksgiving as if he were setting out from one place to another nearby. Well, that is exactly what it is for those who have received the Lord as their Savior. The dying Christian is just moving from one place to another place. For the Christian, death is not a period, but death is a comma in the story of life. And we need to understand that. That's all it is, a comma. An aged Scotsman, while dying, was asked what he thought of death. And he replied, well, it really doesn't matter for me. I know the Lord, whether I live or if I die. If I die, I'll be with Jesus And if I live, Jesus is going to be with me. How precious and how wonderful is that? And we need to look at that, friend. We need to consider the significance of that, the importance of that. It's so sad in our day that so many people don't understand what it's all about. That Christ came and gave his life on Calvary for our sins. And that everything is in order. The reason Peter was interested in our lifestyle is that we are to be a witness And there are a lot of folks professing Christ's name who think that if they can have Jesus in their hearts, uh, they don't need Jesus for their lifestyle. Well, friend, we have to have Jesus for our lifestyle. We are called to godly living. And godliness should mark those who profess to know Christ. 
We are to live looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, verses 12 and 13. Because the heavens will be dissolved and the elements will melt with fervent heat and there will be new heavens and a new earth in which dwells righteousness. We may wonder how we can hasten the coming of the day of God. Well, this is a bit of a mystery. But in Matthew 24, 14, we read, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. To me, this verse suggests that while we are waiting for the Lord to come again, we must be actively engaged in getting the message of the gospel to the ends of the earth. Peter continues his challenge by calling for diligence to be found in Christ, in peace, without spot and blameless. His call is that we must do more than profess Christ. We are to live a life that marks us different from the world in which we find ourselves. Dear friends, we are to have a vibrant, dynamic relationship with Jesus. We discover in this verse, verse 15, that it calls for long-suffering. It calls for adherence to the truth and rejection of false teaching. Paul closes the epistle with a call to steadfastness, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and that he should have the glory both now and forever. In summary, this chapter tells us first to be mindful. We are to be alert. We are to be aware as to what is going on. We are to be informed. Be not ignorant. Verse 8. We are to be diligent in our commitment to God in verse 14. And then, though I didn't share at all, we are to beware. And dear friends, we need to beware right now because there are a whole lot of things going on in our world that are certainly not of God. They're totally from the enemy. Peter's great concern for believers was that they might grow, that they might become mature in Christ. Many years ago, a man by the name of Norman Clayton wrote a song entitled, Only to Be What He Wants Me to Be. Now, it's quite interesting about Norman Clayton. He lived in the city of New York, and his mother took him faithfully to Sunday school and church every Sunday. And he ended up to be a gospel songwriter, and he wrote this song, Only to Be What He Wants Me to Be. And you can only be what God wants you to be by coming to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You can only be what God wants you to be by allowing the Holy Spirit to take over, to take control of your life. Someone has written, what I yield, God takes. What God takes, he cleanses. What he cleanses, he fills. What he fills, he uses. And what God uses, he blesses. Dear friend, I say to you day, today, if you are God's child, if you know the Lord is your Savior, ask the Lord to make you the Christian that he wants you to be. Open your heart to him and say, Lord, take from me anything that hinders my witness and testimony for you. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, I would challenge you today that you might look to the Lord Jesus and confess that you are a sinner, that you don't know what the future holds, but you want to surrender your future to God. You want to know him. Home to know right is life eternal. Friend, I trust that you will bow your head and your heart. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I want you as my Savior. I want to bless others. So, Lord, bless me with your presence, your power, your life, that I might be what you want me to be. Lord, we thank you for your word. Bless it to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.